Hey everyone, welcome to the Rotor Grinders Morning Grind Podcast. I'm your host, CVTPFL. It's Thursday, it's January 25th, it is 2024. We have a seven-game NBA slate that we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about the two NFL games for this weekend, kind of a combined podcast today. Anytime we're talking NFL, we got our good friend Keith Eister. Eyes 819 Keith, what's happening, my friend? Not too much. Uh, look, looking forward to the uh, end of the football playoffs here. Could be an exciting couple of games left. Um, two great championship games, and then obviously the big game a couple weeks from now. But uh, I think I'm pretty confident, like with the teams that are in it, like they deserve to be there. Uh, Philly really fell off at the end. Dallas getting upset, like mildly surprising, but Detroit as a fun upstart team have liked them all, all year long. Um, obviously Baltimore is probably the best complete team with San Francisco right there knocking on the door, but we'll, we'll get into the Debo injury a little bit. Obviously we'll see how healthy they can be uh, come the weekend. Um, but we got some basketball to talk about first. Uh, Giannis is loving being without his, the old coach apparently because dude went for a massive uh, game on Wednesday night, 35, 18 and 10 triple double for him. So nice, nice first showing without Adrian Griffin there for, for Giannis. Yeah, he was balling out. Um, he had 80 fantasy points. Jared Allen had a really good game as well on the other side of that game. That was the two guys that I had like a lot of interest in in that game, and it kind of balled out. Lillard was my bust yesterday, so that worked out. The Charlotte game kind of messed me up. I was really high on the Charlotte game, and just – I mean, they played awful. Uh, Brandon Miller got super hot. I think he had like 11 points in like a minute and a half and then just didn't do anything else the rest of the game, it, it seemed, but – Lamelo had an off night. It was the first time Lamelo had scored under twenty without Rozier all season. Um, so it was very disappointing. He had scored at least twenty eight in eight of nine games that no Rozier. So just a bad night for Lamelo. Bad night for me. Um, I think I will end up coming out really close to break even if Dejounte Murray hits his point prop. So we'll see how that kind of ends up. That first. First quarter in that game was fire, um, so he's already at seven, so hopefully he can keep it rolling. Hope everyone's having a fantastic Wednesday night over there on YouTube. We got a cheers from Miami. Cheers. I'm only, you know, up the coast about eight hours, six hours, <laughs> depending on how fast you drive. Uh, what's up, everyone else? And uh, let's talk some basketball. Like you said, we get Utah at Washington to kick us off here. 243 and a half total in this game. Jazz, seven point favorite. Washington, second end of a back to back. Utah, good to go. I don't assume anybody from Washington ends up sitting here. If anything, maybe Gafford, you know, with him missing a little bit with the concussion. But I, I mean, usually concussion, they're back and they're playing. And, you know, we, we don't typically see downtime. So let's start here. With the Utah side of this one, what do we like for the Jazz going up against the fast-paced little defense Washington Wizards? Yeah, awesome matchup here. High total. Um, both of these teams a little bit tough to figure out from a rotation standpoint, though. Um, I feel like Utah generally plays the same group of players when when the games are competitive, and they've been mostly competitive uh, recently here. They've been much better than they were to start the season at least. Um, so loving this matchup for them, marking in at 8K, I think would be my first target. We've seen him play mid 30s minutes in close games where when Utah's getting blow, blown out, he kind of sticks around that like 28 minute range. Um, so I think there's good opportunity for marketing to get a bunch of minutes in this spot. Uh, Jordan Clarkson, kind of the guy they got like he just didn't get much run in the last game, they got blown out by the Pelicans. Um, but he is capable of playing 30 minutes off the bench and he has a, an awesome usage rate off the bench as well. I think he fits really well in a fast paced game environment. Um, so 6,200 for Clarkson. I'm loving that price tag. My biggest point of interest here on the jazz is the big man. If I know which big man is going to play, but that that's the most difficult thing. Uh, Collins has been starting some nights. He plays 30 minutes, some nights he plays 20 minutes. So it's very difficult. Um, I think ownership is going to play a role in how I play it with these guys. Walker Kessler, obviously the guy behind him, um, but one of the best, if not the best rebounding matchup in all of the NBA. So Collins or, or Kessler, one of them should smash in this spot. I'll probably have exposure to both of them. Uh, Sexton's price is up there, but I think he has upside in this game as well. Um, and then Olenek is down there at just 3,600, just another guy that kind of mucks up the, the big man rotation, but tons of interest in Utah. It's just trying to figure out the rotation here. That's the biggest challenge. 
Yeah, I mean, Kessler, was it a blowout the other night that kept him from playing 30 minutes? It's tough to say. Um, New Orleans absolutely smashed the Jazz. So it's really tough because, I mean, none of the starters, like Markinen, he only played, I think, like 26 or 27 minutes. I know Sexton only got like 24 minutes in that game. Sexton actually had a really solid game for getting beat as bad as they did. So, I, I mean, Markinen and Sexton are still my two favorite options here. I think Kessler is very much in play. You just kind of hope, like you said, he gets that 30 minute roll. Um, <laughs> flip a coin. Um, <laughs> that's how it feels, though, when it comes to Walker Kessler. But I think that overall, this is a spot I would take some shots on him. The matchup is phenomenal. We talk about how bad Washington is against Bigs. I feel like every single day. Let's go to the Washington side of this game. Back to back for Washington. Uh, and, he, and they they played. Minnesota on Wednesday night competitive game. Another team that's rotations are tough. We we saw Bagley get extended run. Gaffer got into foul trouble. Um, I mean, they are two peas in a pod. Uh, you know, you want Bagley because you know his upside. He showed it again, 15, 17. He wants to play basketball, man. Yeah. Talk to me here about Washington. Yeah, I mean that's the situation I'm I'm most interested in is is the big man here as well. It's Gafford and Bagley. Like Bagley has been producing like crazy since he got to Washington when he's been given the opportunity. I don't it, like I don't know exactly what his defensive stats look like. I just dude's rebounding the heck out of the ball. He's scoring like crazy as well. Like Gafford isn't any guy they're looking at is a long-term piece. So I don't know. They might as well give Bagley a, a, a little bit of run and see what they got there. Um, the last game before this against Denver, when Gafford managed to stay out of foul trouble, Bagley only played 18 minutes. So you're definitely gambling here if you take shots on Bagley. But again, like Gafford has has gotten hurt mid games a few times this year. He he can get into foul trouble. I I don't hate some shots on Bagley in, in large field tournaments, even though the minutes are not necessarily secure. The rest of this Washington team just really uncomfortable to try to target and pick out who's going to have the big game. Uh, Kuzma is the, the highest price, probably the safest option. Uh, Pool is a guy who's been wildly inconsistent at 6K. I, I don't hate that, but it's it's probably Gafford and Bagley, the guys I'll take shots on the most here. Yeah, I mean, Kuzma has been filling up the stat sheet a little bit more. You know, his assist rate has been up a little bit. So a good matchup against Utah if he's, you know, what, 18, 8, 8, 20, puts him really close at 7,900, you know, a uh, little bit more upside on that potential so i don't hate kuzma here i like denny and i think that he's someone that could get some you know really solid run in this matchup against utah so uh it's so tough i, I don't think i want to play jordan Poole, and i don't think i want to play jones so looking at gafford denny kuzma bagley would be how i approach this um washington team philadelphia at Indiana, taking on the Pacers, two thirty-seven and a half total in this game. The uh, 76ers, I must call them the 49ers. Um, 76ers, a four and a half point favorite in this one. Mobamba's out, Covington's out, Tobias is questionable with an illness, Melton is out, and then on the Pacers side, Halliburton's already been ruled out for this game, and Jalen Smith is questionable. Jalen Smith left the game the other night with back spasms, so um, we'll definitely be paying attention to that news. But let's start here with Philly. I mean, Embiid is just on another level when it comes to putting the hoop or ball in the hoop. Um, just he's just looking like MVP Embiid, you know. Um, Maxi's price is still really tough to warrant. Harris matters a lot to me because, like, if Harris ends up sitting this game, I think Ubre and Batum become really interesting. Morris becomes more interesting. What are you doing here with Philadelphia? How do you not just keep jamming in Embiid? I mean, he's, he, <laughs> you can just smashing. lock in, yeah, just lock in thirty points. He's got, I, I don't know, fifteen, maybe more than that games in a row with with thirty points at least. Um, set, coming off a seventy point outing against the Spurs, like. Just wild stuff we're seeing from Joel Embiid. He's the primary target here. Um, you're worried about the blowout a little bit with Halliburton out on the other side. Uh, but, I mean, people were worried about the blowout against the Spurs also. And uh, that that didn't work out if you tried to fade Embiid against the Spurs. So he's the very clear first option. 
Um, I think I want Tobias out to try to get any of these other pieces. I think Maxi could get a, a decent usage bump in that situation. Uh, love the Ubre call. I think he's the other guy that could really benefit from Tobias being off the floor. Um, it's it's a great game environment. Indiana plays at a, an extremely fast pace. So maybe I take some small stabs outside of Embiid if Tobias does play. Uh, but if he's out, I'll have a ton of exposure to uh, Maxi and Ubre as well. I'm with you. If Embiid, I mean, okay, if Tobias sits, I- I'm looking at a lot of pieces here because Melton's already out, Mobamba's out. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of minutes to kind of go around here. If everyone plays, it's just Embiid for me. And I'm jamming him in as much as I can. He's just been, he's phenomenal right now. He's doing everything. And then on the, the Indiana side of this game, Siakam hasn't been as aggressive I thought it, as as I thought he was going to be with this team. I really think that him and Halliburton are going to play really well together just overall. But with Siakam playing, I mean, it's just kind of hurt Miles Turner and a lot of the value on this team. We've seen TJ McConnell's minutes just all over the place. Um, I think my favorite play from the Pacers today is nobody. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't hate that call at all. Um, I do think McConnell is, is interesting. Um, I, I have no idea how many minutes he's going to play. Like the the two games, I think he, st- he started at least one of them for sure, I know, but played like 12 minutes. Like that just came out of nowhere. Um, Nemhard has not shown the ability to find a ceiling in any spot. I don't think I'll be chasing that against Dilly here. Um, I agree with you on the Siakam Turner stuff. Like Siakam has just limited Miles Turner ceiling, but he himself hasn't been all that aggressive. So he probably needs a distributor like Halliburton on the field on, on the floor to really uh, to help him take that step here with Indiana. And I agree. I think that's going to be a nice pairing uh, as we move into the second half of the season here. But for me, it's kind of tough, especially in a, a dip, more difficult matchup with Philly. Like it's probably just TJ McConnell for me. Yeah, and McConnell, I mean, McConnell is a guy that, like, on a seven-game slate, if he scores, like, 25, he probably doesn't beat you. So it, it's tough. And, like, okay, I want to see the news on, like, Jalen Smith playing or not. Um, because, like, if he were if he were to sit here maybe a few extra minutes, but, I mean, he sat in the Denver game, and there really wasn't, like, an increase for anybody in that game. Matherin played... 28 minutes off the bench in that one. But, I mean, just Matthew and McConnell's second-team usage is just is, – is the second-team usage. Um, we saw Ben Shepard play all fourth quarter the other night against Denver in a close game. But it sounds like Isaiah Jackson's going to play. Um, I, I don't know. It's just – it's kind of a – it's kind of a mess. Let's just call it how it is. It's kind of a mess. Minnesota at Brooklyn, 217 total in this game. The Timberwolves, a four and a half point favorite back to back for them. Brooklyn side, Cam Johnson is questionable. Sharp, Simmons, Whitehead remain out. Uh, Minnesota side here first. Mike Conley, illness, um, ended up missing Wednesday's game. We'll see if he's back for this one or not. Uh, What do we like here for Minnesota? Yeah, uh, back-to-back for Minnesota and third in four nights. They played Monday night as well. Uh, Conley missed Monday night also. So have to definitely have to pay attention to that news. If Conley is able to make it back, it's going to make it really tough to have a bunch of interest in Minnesota here. Slow-paced game against Brooklyn. Um, guys like Naw and Kyle Anderson have seen their prices come up with Conley missing a couple of games here. Um, Gobert is one of the things I got right Wednesday night. He had a big game um, against Washington. I like the matchup for him here against Brooklyn, but I am concerned about this Minnesota team just from a rest standpoint. Three games in, in four nights is always a tough spot uh, and on the road as well. So there's there's travel involved. Um, Ed, Edwards had a great game Wednesday night as well, but I just I don't know how much I'm targeting this Minnesota team. If Conley is out, then my tune on that changes a little bit. Um, I definitely think that you can keep playing guys like Alexander Walker, uh, Kyle Anderson, even Jaden McDaniels is is okay as a, a value type piece, um, but we'll we'll just have to see if Conley is able to suit up for this one. Uh, the one guy I probably have interest in, no matter what, is Rudy Gobert. 
Yeah, right back to it. I said it. I said it yesterday. I said we need to go right back to him after a bust. Sixteen boards, four blocks, nineteen points. Really solid game against Washington. Again, like Washington's just such a bad rebounding team. What we were talking about with like Walker Kessler, we saw Gobert absolutely smash them. I am worried a little bit about like tired legs for Edwards and and Cat. Like they are shooters. I mean, like Edwards is still gonna chuck. Don't get me wrong. Um. But like we we even kind of saw it on Wednesday. We saw twenty percent from three for Cat and Edwards shot three for ten from three point line. So already kind of getting a little bit of tired legs. Edwards scored thirty eight points because he went to the free throw line fourteen times. So you're just a little concerned about that. If Conley sits, I mean Alexander Walker should play thirty minutes. They're not good minutes typically, but he'll be on the floor for thirty minutes at forty five hundred. Going to the Brooklyn side of this game. I mean, Claxton is my favorite play from Brooklyn right now, just in general, because with Sharp being out, Claxton's just kind of been the guy that we've been asking for. He's been getting 35 minutes a game and really kind of producing with it. It becomes a little bit more interesting if Cam Johnson sits. That's, you know, 25 minutes that has to be filled in somebody somewhere maybe it's spencer dinwiddie at 5200 but i'm never excited about the play uh, playing the brooklyn nets yeah it's always tough to figure out especially like dennis smith jr seems to be taking over dinwiddie's role a little bit uh 29 minutes for dsj in that last game yeah like it's hard to hard to know what they're going to do with that point guard slot um lonnie walker is back now He's not been playing a ton, you know, like, but he, when he's out there, he's going to take shots. We know that. So he takes away from usage in the, on the second unit. I think the only real interest here, and it's only mild interest is Michael Bridges. And that's just for a ceiling. We saw him smash 55 DK points against a really tough Knicks defense. So, I mean, that's the kind of game that you're hunting here, um, but I won't do it in more than like one or two lineups out of 20. Oh, Brooklyn, <laughs> Brooklyn, Brooklyn, Brooklyn. Yeah, just a, it's a really tough team to figure out. I think you make an excellent point with DSJ. Um, definitely wouldn't play DSJ and Dinwiddie together. I'll, I'll say that. Um, yeah. Again, I, I just think Claxton continues to be the guy. It's a really tough matchup for him in this one. But, I mean, he's he's excelled in tough matchups plenty of times this year. Denver at New York taking on the Knicks in this one, 224 total. Denver is a two and a half point favorite. Denver side, pretty much good to go. Strother remains out. And then on the Knicks, um, Hartenstein's questionable. Mitch Rob is out. Let's start here with Denver. Jokic, always a top end type of play on any given slate. Michael Porter Jr. was awful the other night. Um, just awful. Gosh, he was so bad. Uh, talk to me here about Denver. Yeah, always starts with Jokic. Uh, I mean, I definitely prefer Embiid. He's in a much better game environment, much better matchup. Uh, so give me Embiid over Jokic if if spending up. Um, not that I won't have some Jokic in my pool. The matchup doesn't matter for him. He can go off for a 30-point triple-double against anybody. Uh, Murray's price is really climbing. Like, he's been outstanding here recently, but in a tough matchup, all the way up to 8,700 now. Aaron Gordon back, like, a fully healthy Denver team. I don't think I'm paying 8,700 for Jamal Murray. Um, I would much rather chase Porter. Uh, I know he definitely struggled the other night um, in a good matchup against Indiana, but I'd rather take shots on MPJ than, than Murray. I think Gordon might be my favorite secondary piece here. Um, the price tag is coming down. 5,600 is not a bad price for Gordon, who does a little bit of everything. Uh, not the best rebounding matchup. Although if, if Hartenstein ends up missing on the other side, it's not a terrible rebounding matchup, I don't think. So 5,600 for Aaron Gordon. The minutes are are back to normal levels, uh, 31 and 32 in his last two games. Uh, so I think Gordon at 5,600 might be my my second favorite nugget. Yeah, like Jamal Murray's price is caught up, right? Like when, we, when he was like 8K, it was like, all right. Well, now at 8,700, it doesn't sound like a huge increase, but $700 goes a long way when building a lineup. So... Um, I, I mean, Jokic is always my favorite ceiling play. I don't mind this spot for Aaron Gordon. I like that call. His price is, is down far enough. Um, I'll probably build one team, Michael Porter Jr., just because he tilted me so hard the other night. And if he goes bonkers in this game, I'll be mad um, <laughs> straight up. 
Let's go to the Knicks side here. I mean, the Knicks, another team that has been just absolutely frustrating for a lot of people with this Hartenstein it, out news. Um, like nothing we can, with nothing we can trust right now. Jericho Sims started; he played twenty six minutes. He doesn't rebound the basketball, kind of what you were just talking about. If Hartenstein's out, we thought I honestly thought Precious was going to get more run, and he yeah. did play. Like he f- ended up finally playing like the last fifteen minutes of the game, and that's when New York made a run, and they ended up beating Brooklyn. Maybe he gets more run because of it. Um, like they kind of you just got to start him at this point. Like dude, we've seen this Jericho Sims thing multiple times. He's he's not even an NBA level player. Like you just they have to start Precious, right? I mean, I think whoever starts is playable. I, I think if, like, if Precious Precious starts, I like him way more because, like, he's yeah. power forward center eligible where Sims is just center. I think we'll have enough value where I don't have to play Jericho Sims, but I really think I want Precious to start. Um, gosh, like, Sims had 17 of his 22 fantasy points in the first quarter of that game. And like I said, Precious played the last 15 minutes when they made the run. Josh Hart had a big role in that run that they made in the late in that game. So Julius Randle, if Hartenstein's out, is going to get a bump in rebounds. He always has assists and point ability. Jalen Brunson, plenty of point ability. Um, it, it's just kind of waiting on the Hartenstein news. Like I, I think like that news matters, and who's starting for the Knicks matters a lot here. Yeah, I mean, the siding between Randall and Brunson is always difficult for me. Like, I, I never seem to get it right. I feel like I want to go to Randall more in this situation, especially if Hartenstein misses. Like you said, the bump in rebounds matters. Um, he He's not a huge rebounder uh, as long as, like, Mitchell Robinson and Hartenstein are out there. Um, but it, if it's Jericho Sims again, I, I think he definitely has upside for, like, 10 or 12 boards in this spot. Uh, and we know the points are going to be there. The usage has been just – insane since rj barrett and emmanuel quickly have been traded away so i i like randall from a usage perspective uh if he can get that rebound boost as well i I'm, that's definitely the way i'm leaning brunson always seems to find a way every now and again um we know he has like 60 point ceiling so certainly would have a, a share or two of him as well uh and then anything else it's just it's waiting on that hartenstein news boston at miami Let's do it. We got a 225 total here. Celtics, a seven-point favorite in this one. Miami, second end of a back-to-back. Boston, nobody on the injury report for them in this one. Let's go to Boston first. What are your thoughts here when it comes to the Celtics? Fully healthy. Um, Tough matchup against Miami. Slow-paced game, but it should be a competitive game, I think, although Miami kind of laid an egg on Wednesday night. So maybe it won't be competitive while they try to figure out how Terry Rozier fits into that rotation. Um, like, but with Boston healthy, it's just difficult to want to play them unless they have a fantastic matchup. Of course, you can play Tatum for ceiling, Jalen Brown and Porzingis. Like, there's just there's so so like the stars. It's hard to figure out which guy's going to go off, and then it's not the best game environment either. I struggle with the Boston side here. Um, do I spend the extra money and get up to Tatum, or do I hope a guy like Brown or Porzingis goes off for a little bit cheaper. Um, Porzingis has a really tough matchup with Bam on the other side, so I think I lean to Jalen Brown if I'm picking between the three studs. But again, it, it's really tough. It's it's mild interest at best just because of the game environment. And I don't think I'm touching anything else in the game, or on the Boston side at least. Yeah, I mean, Boston side's easy for me. It's Tatum or Brown if you want to pay up, or just they're they're too healthy. I mean, they... Unless some people get ruled out, it's so hard to play this team right now. Like we've seen Luke Cornett play enough minutes now where he like he's kind of eating in to the production of Horford and Porzingis on nights where it's just like these guys are priced up now where if you're playing Boston, I think you're just playing Tatum or Brown. And then on the Miami side of this game, we kind of assume that Jaquez doesn't come back for this game. It didn't sound like it. And Kevin Love left the game with illness, I think he only ended up playing like four or five minutes in that Memphis game on Wednesday. Rozier played off the bench, 29 minutes. I honestly, I'd be shocked if Richardson starts over Rozier um, on the second and back to back Uh, with them giving him almost 30 minutes off the bench. I think we see Terry Rozier slide into the starting lineup and Josh Richardson slide out of the starting lineup for this one. 
Yeah, I agree. I feel like that was just kind of a way to get him acclimated. Um, expecting him to step in and run an offense that he just learned in, in a day or whatever amount, amount of time he had, it wasn't much, is is a big ask. So I, I think that's just kind of the route they were taking, and, and Rogier does jump in there. I, I don't think they traded for him for him to run the second unit. Um, so I definitely expect him to start uh, at the point alongside Hero uh, in this spot. Uh, the other spot that's up for grab for a starter with Hawkeyes out, we saw uh, Hayward Highsmith jump into. If Love is banged up as well, um, Highsmith could be out there for, for quite a few minutes. He's only 3,500. So if, if looking for value, um, he played – let me see. I just had that. I lost it. Um, Highsmith played 24 minutes in that game. Uh, Love only played five minutes. So you can probably expect like 24 to 26 minutes from Highsmith if he grabs a start. Not a good matchup against Boston, but 3,500, it's it's tough to find guys who are going to play significant minutes at that price tag. And like I said, Love left the game with the illness, so we don't even know if he'll be playing at all in this game. So could see Highsmith play 25 minutes again. Yeah, Miami's a tough... No, go Hero and Butler are like off my list completely. Like, I think Rogier. I talked about this a little bit on Crunch Time. Like, Rogier could help Bam. He's just a better playmaker than Kyle Lowry. So I could see like pick and roll stuff with Bam being a little bit better. We saw Bam smash on, on Wednesday night. So if I was paying up for Bam, Butler, or Hero, like it's very clearly Bam in this situation for me. I will say I was on um, salary tags on lineup HQ Wednesday. That's what I do on Wednesdays. Um, and I don't know. I don't have pricing up in front of me, but Caleb Martin was really cheap on FanDuel on Wednesday. So check that. He might be cheap over there again. Um, his role, I don't think is going to change. I think he's going to get a lot of usage on that second unit. And I think the usage goes up if Rogier ends up starting. So I don't think I want to play Caleb Martin at 4,900 on, on DraftKings, but if he's cheap on FanDuel again, I think you could take some shots over there on him. All right, we got Sacramento at Golden State Warriors, second end of a back to back, 240 and a half total here. Kings, a one and a half point favorite. Nobody on the injury report here for the Kings. Let's go to Sacramento first. Uh, Golden State running, running, <laughs> running up and down the court here against the Hawks on Wednesday. That game, 59 to 66 with a minute and a half to go in the second quarter. Um, we knew that was going to be a fast paced game. Any concern about that? here in golden state and is anybody we want to take advantage of here on sacramento yeah i mean golden state's not a young team so that definitely has to factor in here um this should be a really fast-paced game as well like sacramento plays at a decent clip um on the sacramento side like Darren fox has just been awful like way too way too often for me to want to play him um, he does have a couple of decent games over the last month or so, but it's been r- pretty brutal outside of a couple of those uh, ceiling games. I don't think I'm paying 9K for De'Aaron Fox in the spot. I would much rather find an extra 900 and get up to Sabonis. Um, Malik Monk, I think, would be my second target here. Just has so much usage off the bench. Minutes are, are never quite what you want him to be, but um, if he gets hot, we've seen him play up upwards of 30 before. Um, I think that's probably about it on the Sacramento side. Like Kevin Herter's been bouncing all over the place minutes wise. Um, I, like he has two awesome games in the last four, but who knows if he's going to even play 30 minutes, let alone the 39 he played the other night. Like it's, it's just really tough from a, a minute standpoint for Herter. Yeah. So for me, when it comes to this team, I think Keegan Murray and Sabonis are my two favorite targets. Um, Sabonis is expensive, but like, Another guy that just produces on a nightly basis. Triple-double upside every night, it seems like, with Sabonis. So I think Sabonis is someone we could definitely look at here at this price range. Um, And then Fox, like you said, he's so inconsistent. Yeah, ceiling is nice, but, I mean, when's the last time Fox really had a ceiling game? I'm not talking about, like, a 50-point game. Like, it was December, his last 60-point game, and 60... 60 is probably good enough at 9K, but 50 is not. Not on this slate. There's too much star power on this slate. Golden State side, I mean, we talk about it all the time. One of the best things the Kings do for DFS is allow three-pointers. We got one of the best three-point shooting team in the NBA. 
I, I, I mean, I don't like playing Curry. He's averaging 30 points in three outings against this team this season. We've seen Clay average about 17 points and 30 fantasy points. Any interest here in the Warriors? I feel like I should for the game environment. I feel like this could be a, a really fast-paced game, but on, on the back-to-back, I'm a little bit concerned. Um, like I just, Curry, I haven't played Curry very much at all this season. Uh, Pajemski's cheap, Clay Thompson's cheap, but like they're so scoring dependent, it's difficult to find the ceiling with either of them. Uh, Draymond is probably the guy I would want to play. I'm just, I'm not sure he's going to even suit up for this game on a back-to-back. Um, have to see how many minutes he plays Wednesday night. Looks like they're approaching halftime here. And let me just refresh that real quick. I think he's on pace for about 24 minutes. So it seems like they're taking it. Yeah. 26 minutes. He's on pace for, I mean, that's, that's about what we have projected. Eventually he's going to be back starting and, and playing 30 plus minutes. And that $5,600 price tag is going to be way too cheap. I just, I don't know that we're there yet, especially on a back to back. Um, I took a couple shots on, on Draymond on Wednesday night, just, like expecting the minutes to kind of creep back up, but I don't know. We'll see. Uh, pr- probably just wait and see mode on Draymond. And really it's probably Steph is the only guy I'm going to have a little bit of exposure to maybe pods. The other guy. I'm going to probably fire up a little bit more Dario Sarge. I know um, he only played 10 minutes in the first half of the game on Wednesday. And we talked about him on the podcast yesterday, but Fantasy point per minute. He's at 10 fantasy points. Hopefully you can kind of get some rebounds to go along with his points in the second half if you ended up playing him. I have him on my single entry team today, but that team was smashed with LaMelo and Charlotte, so it doesn't even matter. Uh, Let's go to the last game. We got Chicago at LA taking on the Lakers in this one. 224 total. Lakers a four and a half point favorite on the Bulls side. Craig, Ball, Levine, Outs. Lakers side, Anthony Davis and LeBron questionable. Cam Reddish out, Vincent out. Oh, yay. 10-30 game with LeBron and Anthony Davis questionable. <laughs> Let's talk Chicago first. What do we like here for the Bulls? Yeah, um, it's Kobe White for me. Like He's been incredible all season long while Zach Levine is out of the lineup. So 7,600, he has probably going to play around 40 minutes, upper 30s for sure in this spot. The usage has has been up significantly without uh, Zach Levine. So Kobe White at 7,600 before DeRozan and Vucevic for me. Uh, the the matchup for Z- for Vooch is is not great with with Anthony Davis protecting the paint. Probably don't get there. DeRozan just hasn't had the same level of usage all season long. Not not a guy that I've played very much at all this season. So very little, if any, interest uh, on DDR. I think. Caruso is playable, little revenge game, maybe showcasing himself for a trade to see if he can get moved out there back to LA. Um, the minutes have been solid. Uh, he's been over 30 a couple of times here. Seemed like the injury stuff is kind of behind him. Uh, and he's having the best three point shooting season of his career. So Caruso may be a little bit more upside than people realize at this point with his three point shooting added, added into um, his stocks that he has always been good at collecting 5,100 for a guy that should play 30 minutes. I, I don't hate some shots on Caruso. Kobe White's probably my favorite play from the Lakers. If I'm going to play anybody, um, but I like the Caruso call. I think he's a really interesting play. I don't necessarily hate this spot for Vooch. If Drummond sits, I love this spot or not Drummond. If Davis sits, I like the spot for Vooch a lot. Yeah. Good call. Uh, Cause I mean, it, it, to me, <laughs> Vucevic would eat up Christian Wood. Sorry, Christian Wood. No, <laughs> no offense. Um, and Vanderbilt. Like, sorry guys, no offense. But let's. Uh, <laughs> Derek says Caruso might go off. It's like get me out of the Chicago winter. Um, <laughs> let's go Lakers side here. I mean, it's really simple, right? If AD plays, LeBron sits. You take AD and Russell with some Reeves. If LeBron plays and Davis sits. You take some LeBron with Russell and Reeves and Hachimura. If they both sit, you play all the Russell and all the Reeves and that all the Hachimura. Problem is, we might not know where we can adjust to them both sitting here because, like, this is a ten thirty game, and the Golden State's a ten o'clock game. But like the Miami and every other game in front of that is a seven thirty Eastern game, so. 
We hope this news comes out early in the day. The Lakers have been good about reporting this year, knock on wood, but it is the NBA. And like, it wouldn't shock me if we get this news where we can't adjust a lot. Yeah. I mean, you broke it down perfectly on, on who we're playing in what scenario there. So I, I don't have much to add. Um, just going through and looking at swaps, like just loading up on Sabonis, I think, um, with a little bit of AD um, and then just pivoting a ton of Sabonis into AD if LeBron ends up sitting is the easiest kind of one-for-one -one swap that I, I see just at first glance here. Um, like there's no straight line pivots for LeBron if AD were to sit um, at the forward position. So you like you could set up some stuff with um, – Fox, if you're comfortable doing that, Steph Curry um, would probably be my preferred option there uh, and, and just pivot some util stuff in from Curry into LeBron if AD were to sit. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have interest, like slow paced game against Chicago, but if, if one of the stars sits, I mean, you have to have interest in the Lakers. Um, LeBron and AD just do so much for this team. If everybody is healthy and playing, uh, I think Anthony Davis is the only real interest. It's hard to ignore what D'Angelo Russell is doing. Um, like since he's been moved back into the starting lineup, he has back-to-back uh, -back 50 point games here. I know um, LeBron sat in that last one. Like I, I certainly don't expect 50 points for him, uh, but if he's going to continue to play mid 30s minutes at 7K, I, th I think he can have some interest in Russell as well. Yeah, Russell. For me to play Russell, I have to have one of these guys out. Like I, I have to have one of these guys out. I, I don't That's think fair. I can play Russell with both of them playing. Um, all right, we're gonna skip the morning grind game so we can talk some football so we can get everything kind of fit in here. Um, any final thoughts on NBA before we switch over to some NFL? Um, uh, the the first two games of the night look really, really good. Um, and then like it's gonna be a it's gonna be a difficult sl slate from a news standpoint unless we get the Lakers news early. But just kind of what the stuff that we talk about. But as always, pay attention to the news. Um, LeBron and AD have p played through Q tags plenty enough, so I would say if we don't have news, I I may just just load up on the early games and hope that that news doesn't break bad for me late. Derek wants us to give a six X play. You got a six X play today? Um, yeah. We just talked about Kobe White. Like I think his ceiling with um, with no Zach Levine is tremendous. Uh, Jordan Clarkson in one of the the first games of the night that we talked about. Uh, I think he, this is an awesome spot for him in a, a fast paced game against Washington. Yeah, mine was going to be Sexton. Um, yeah. I absolutely love Colin Sexton. I think Colin Sexton's way way too cheap for this matchup. So been producing over thirty eight fantasy points in five straight and. 6,600, so if you're looking for a 6X play, I really like Sexton. I don't hate the Clarkson call, but Clarkson's so closely priced to Sexton now, I do prefer Sexton over him. All right, let's talk some football. Yeah, yeah, football. I'm excited for this weekend. Um, I know you're probably excited as well. Like, yeah. just two really phenomenal football games. Um, we'll see what the weather kind of does here in this Baltimore game. That could kind of put a hamper something to definitely watch because it would make a difference, but does it, I mean, a little bit of rain and 10 mile an hour winds doesn't bother me. We're going to have great wind or great weather in San Francisco for this game. Um, let's talk football. We start with Kansas city at Baltimore, 44 and a half total in this one. Baltimore is a three point favorite. Let's start with the chiefs. Nobody said they could do it, and they did it. They went into Buffalo, and I don't know if it was them doing it or Josh Allen just – Josh Allen played great. Okay, I'm not even going to hate on Josh Allen because I think Josh Allen played great. He had a really good game. Just a bunch of stuff, man. But let's uh, let's talk Chiefs. We kind of saw Travis Kelsey um, get, back, get back in the end zone twice. That was good to see. And we saw Jason Kelsey celebrating uh, with his shirt <laughs> off. That was fantastic. Incredible um, stuff. Only person that can upstage Taylor Swift is Jason Kelsey. So that was awesome. But uh, I, there's so many stuff about like how Kylie was talking about, hey, this is the first time you're meeting Taylor. And Jason's like, yeah, I'm taking my shirt off and jumping out and I'm celebrating with Bill's Mafia. Oh, <laughs> 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 uh, Anyway, we have... Okay, so... Over the last two weeks, since we're starting with the Chiefs, Travis Travis Kelsey, 16 targets in the two playoff games. The games are on the line. He's going to look to Travis Kelsey. Um, we saw Rice have a big game against Miami. 
I wouldn't necessarily say he struggled in the Buffalo game. He had he caught all four targets. We saw a lot more like MVS get involved in that game. He had four targets. Um, it was the first time since week 14 against Buffalo to MVS. I still think it's Rice, Kelsey, Pacheco here. Watch the Pacheco news. I assume that he is going to play, um, and it's just kind of a toe injury. What are your thoughts here on Kansas City? Yeah, um, it's Rice and Kelsey for me first. Uh, Pacheco being banged up is a little concerning, but the matchup is even more concerning. This Baltimore defense is no joke. Um, I just I, I think the Chiefs throw it a ton in this spot. We've seen them be really pass heavy in the past. They've gotten away from that a little bit this year, but it's mostly because their wide receivers aren't very good. Um, and Kelsey was seemingly lost a step. But with Kelsey back in the fold looking really good the last two weeks, Rasheed Rice doing his thing, I, I think they're going to throw it a ton in this spot against Baltimore. Uh, so I'm I'm down a little bit on Pacheco, and that's just that's assuming that he's going to be one of the higher owned running backs on the slate. I think he's probably second behind McCaffrey. Um, I probably end up underweight on Pacheco. It's it's Rice and it's Kelsey for me. I don't I, I still don't think I'm taking shots on these cheap Kansas City wide receivers. Like it, it just hasn't worked out for him all season long. One of them probably gets there, but just throw the names in a hat and pick one out and hope you get lucky if that's the route that you want to go. Um, it's Rice and Kelsey. That's about it. Yeah, but there, there's like reports that Tony is good to go. Um, I don't think Sky Moore returns. He wasn't practicing still on Wednesday, um, so earlier today. It's Rice and Kelsey. I don't hate Patrick Mahomes in this spot, but again, like we've talked about it so much recently, like Patrick Mahomes has not had a ceiling game since week seven, and he's only had one game over 30 fantasy points this year. I think you could play his pieces and play Lamar on the other side of this game. I think Lamar has one of the highest ceilings of any quarterback. He probably has the highest ceiling of any quarterback this week. So let's go to the Baltimore side. We talked up Mark Andrews so much last week, ended up sitting again, um, but expected back now. Like we now are getting the expected back. Lamar Jackson ran for 100 yards. He threw for 150. He ran two touchdowns in. He threw two touchdowns in. Um, He's in that territory for me on a four game or a four team slate, two game slate, where it's plug in Lamar and it's plug in McCaffrey, and then I'm going to build. Yeah, I don't hate that call. As far as ceiling goes, at, at their respective positions, they're they're in a different tier than everybody else. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, I love the Lamar with KC pass catchers call because Lamar does have that ability to run for two touchdowns, or even Lamar with one of his pass catchers and two chiefs players like that. Is, I love building like that. I think that's, that's a great call. Um, Andrews is, is the guy, right? We talked about it all last week. Didn't end up suiting up likely um, had a, had a decent role again, obviously without uh, Andrews, but Andrews is going to step right back into that role uh, as the lead guy in this offense, assuming that he is, I mean, anywhere near healthy and it like he didn't test it. Like it's not like last week he tried it and couldn't go. So I think they're they're making sure that he's good to go. Um, I, as long as he's active, I fully expect him to be out there on the field a ton. And he, even if he's not like playing eighty percent of the snaps, the the snaps that he is out there on the field, the ball's going his direction. So Mark Andrews is one of my favorite plays on the entire slate. I I do think that dings flowers slightly. I, I talked about that a little bit last week. Um, so I I have some reservations about flowers. The $5,800 price tag is, is kind of nice, so I, I could see him getting there. Um, I don't know. Like the the pass catchers for Lamar are why I like playing uh, Chiefs guys on the other side because it's, it's just hard to figure out like when Aguilar catches that random touchdown or when when Odell is going to pick up five or six targets. Like it's it's a little bit uh, convoluted at the wide receiver position for for Baltimore, outside is a Flowers. We know Flowers is going to be out there. He's going to get his targets. I just think that Andrews being on the field like hurts his touchdown equity and hurts his upside for like 10 to 12 targets. But Andrews is a very clear click for me. Um, can mess around with the Baltimore wide receivers a little bit. Flowers is obviously the best. Yeah, I mean, like Beckham's projecting for a lot of ownership right now um, for a two-game slate. So I'm perfectly okay with being underweight on him. I think if I was going to play – a cheap wide receiver here would be Aguilar. They have special yeah. plays in the red zone for him. Um, Love it. Where he gets way too much more, way more involved 
3,800. I don't hate it. Um, my favorite pairing with him is going to be Andrews. I love Lamar. Going to be pairing him a lot with the Kansas City side. And just really quick, I think we should mention this just in general. I love tight end in the flex on the slate. I think the tight end, like you, you, I don't have a favorite of the four. I think all four of them are fantastic. Um, especially if Debo ends up sitting, like all four tight ends are fantastic. So when you're comparing on this slate, when you're comparing like where these tight ends are priced compared to like some of the players around them, like Kittle, Edwards is more expensive than Kittle on DraftKings. Like, okay. Like, you know, so I think it's a very good two tight end week. Um, I just wanted to bring that up in general because all four of these guys could score multiple touchdowns and it wouldn't shock me. Yeah, I think that's an awesome call. I, I played quite a bit of that last weekend um, and it worked out with several guys. Like we generally say, try to avoid that in, in especially large field tournaments because it caps your ceiling. Well, not with these four guys. Like you said, all, all four of them have, the upside for two touchdowns and a hundred plus yards. So these are four of the highest upside tight ends that there are. And in their price range, comparing them with wide receivers, like Zay Flowers is the only guy in that, in the mid range and Rasheed Rice maybe, but he's a little bit more expensive than, than all of them, except Kelsey. Um, like there's just, there's not a ton of upside at wide receiver um, in the, in the mid range. So unless you can get up to Amonra, then, yeah, maybe Ayuk and but and Rice, but they're you, you can save a little bit of money by going down to tight end. So I think that's a, an excellent point by you. Well, it's like Beckham is forty four hundred projected for eighteen percent ownership. Find the six hundred dollars and play Andrews at lower for ownership. Sure. And I do uh, the uh, given throughout the week. I do think that we're gonna see more ownership on Andrews when he becomes like he's practicing fully. He was back at practice last week. Um, He's going to be good to go. It's not going to be just red zone stuff. He still has three touchdown upside. If it's just red zone stuff, like he is Lamar's guy in the red zone. Let's go to the other game. This game's phenomenal. Um, I am I, I I don't have it on, but I am a true blue Detroit Lions fan this weekend. <laughs> um, as everyone knows, how much I like Christian McCaffrey. I've talked about him since he got drafted. If you're a longtime listener, going back to the Siege days and me and Siege arguing about Christian McCaffrey and Leonard Fournette, um, sorry, Siege, but I'm still <laughs> right. Uh, 50 and a half total in this one. San Francisco is seven point favorite. Let's go Detroit Lions here first. Tough matchup. I'm throwing matchups out the window, Keith. They, they're just out of the window. Um, I mean, Jared Goff is the cheapest of the four quarterbacks. A lot of people are going to play Brock Purdy over Jared Goff. I I get it. I understand 100% why you would do that. Let's talk Detroit Lions. They have surprised everybody this year. Both running backs have upside. We know St. Brown has upside. We keep talking about Josh Reynolds. I think even if Raymond plays, Josh Reynolds is not coming off the field in this one. There's too much trust with Jared Goff. Uh, We saw it last weekend in close game. Laporta keeps playing through this injury nine catches last week i know we talked about just being a little worried about his knee not worried at all not anymore um let's go lions yeah it, amonra is is where it obviously all starts uh he's the usage hog in this 14 targets last week those games are are very common for him um laporta is the guy i wanted to talk about as well because i was with you a little bit scared last week I, I saw all I needed to see last week, 11 targets uh, do look good out there and looked like he was a lot closer to a hundred percent than, than maybe we thought. So Laporta with his role at 5,400, again, just going back to that two tight end thing, like use your util spot as a, a spot for one of these other upside uh, tight ends here. Uh, the Reynolds call you're spot on with as well. Uh, just the end zone targets for me, like even if, if he only gets three targets like last week, one of those is probably going to be in the end zone. He happened to catch it last week. He's still only 4K. Like one touchdown and one catch, one touchdown at 4K is useful on a two-game slate. Like I don't, I I'm completely with you. It's Reynolds. I keep chasing Jamison Williams as well. Um, I'm going to keep doing that just because the upside is tremendous. I have no problem overstacking this Lions team. Um, they're expected to play from behind. I think Jared Goff could drop back 40 times in this game. And for that reason, I'm loading up on the Detroit passing game. Um, 
as much of Monra and Laporta as I can fit, throw in Reynolds and Williams as well. I don't hate playing all four of the pass catchers if I have Goff. Uh, most of them I think I would limit to three, but I think four is okay. From the running backs, it's always going to be Gibbs for me when they're projected to play from behind. He just has more upside out of the backfield than Montgomery. Um, I mean, Mo- Montgomery has probably has a slightly higher touchdown equity, uh, but Gibbs still has a, a little bit of a roll down inside the five there. We've seen it a couple of times. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll probably be lighter on running backs. It's all, I'm almost certainly playing uh, tight end or wide receiver in the utility. So I, I feel like I'm generally going to be w- underweight on most running backs outside of McCaffrey. Um, but I, I would definitely prefer Gibbs over Montgomery. Let's talk about Brock Wright going. He's not going to play fractures for him. Um, they signed Zach Ertz to the practice squad. And I don't know if a week's enough time. Um, Zach Ertz is a veteran. Very good pass catcher tight end. Wright was more of a, a blocking tight end. If Ertz is active, how many teams would you have to play before you start getting exposure to Ertz? I mean, I th- I think he will be out there. And like the Laporta role looked incredible. But they do play a ton of two tight end stuff. You're right. Um, so do they trust Ertz as a blocker? I, I don't know. Um, that's what i'm worried field, about too yeah yeah like it did they just pick him up to fill the brock Wright role would be my biggest concern um i would probably i'd probably have one or two in a 20 lineup build um i just i think i'm going to be way overexposed to tight ends and playing two tight ends and at like half my lineups type of thing um yeah i i, I think tw- in 20 lineups i would have at least one or i think yeah i don't mind it um he's so cheap right like if he he has two catches and one of them touchdown, like at 2,800, eight points, nine points. Yeah. It's not going to kill You're you on a four. That. Yeah. It's not going to kill you on a two game slate. So, all right, let's go to San Francisco. I mean, the biggest news on the slate is, is definitely Debo Samuel. Um, you, you, you saw it. He was in a lot of pain last weekend. Um, yeah. he tried to come back in the game and instantly said, I'm out. I, I need out. Um, Huge loss for San Francisco with Debo out. Love Ayuk. I think Jennings is going to get a lot of love, and I understand that. But if Debo sits, George Kittle, um, just a phenomenal play. I know we're going to talk tight ends this whole time. My question to you is, Detroit has the number one run DVOA. They're fantastic against the run. Christian McCaffrey is not your typical running back. As we saw last week against Green Bay, he had 12 targets, seven catches. What are we doing with Christian McCaffrey? He should be the highest owned player on the slate. If he's not, it's silly. <laughs> what are we doing with CMC here? I Yeah, he will be the highest owned player on the slate, and I will be over the field. I, I think a, ma- a tough run matchup actually raises Christian McCaffrey's ceiling because he has 12 target upside. Like they're If they can't run the ball, they're just going to check it down to him, run dump offs, run screens for him. He's just, they're going to find a way to get the ball in his hands, no matter what. And receptions are much more value valuable than carries, especially on DraftKings where it's full PPR. So I think a tough running matchup actually raises the ceiling for Christian McCaffrey. We know he has massive touchdown equity. Um, he's probably favored to score in this game. I, I'll be over the field. He's going to be popular. He's expensive. I don't care. He, he has the highest upside on the slate. Yes. i mean um i think if you want to get creative on this slate you could potentially take some shots on ray ray mcleod he might get one or two deep targets in this game um i think jennings is going to be a very very popular value play if devo sits he should be Ayuk is phenomenal under 7k brock purdy's phenomenal as one of the cheaper quarterback options Uh, detroit's terrible against the pass so don't be afraid to fire up a Brock Purdy, Christian McCaffrey, George Kittle, or Ayuk team. Um, double stacking with Christian McCaffrey is never a bad idea. Yeah, I, I love that. I've done it a bunch in the playoffs already. Um, and even in, during the season, I, I did enough of that. Um, I, I think they're perfectly fine just using the short passing game as kind of a substitute for the run, running game. So I think that raises Purdy ceiling as well. I think Kittle is an absolute smash if Debo is not out there. Um, IU certainly has upside. We've seen massive games from him. 
So, yeah, I mean, I love this San Francisco um, passing game in particular, and I'm including McCaffrey in that that passing game for sure. Before we move on and play the morning grind game for one last time, um, unless we do some big game stuff, which we might, because why not? Um, before we move on, are you prioritizing any defense this week of the four options, or are you just whoever kind of fits the build is in? It's going to be whoever fits the build is in. Like predicting defensive scoring is so difficult anyway. And like, I, yeah, I mean, I think it's probably Baltimore, San Francisco going to the big game, but I don't think that's a lock by any means. It wouldn't surprise me for Purdy to make a mistake and Detroit to run back a pick six. And then all of a sudden, like at their price, all you need is a pick six. You don't care how many points San Francisco scores on the other side of that. Detroit is probably my favorite defense just yeah. because I think they're going to be the lowest zone defense and defense is so, like you said, it's so unpredictable. They get after the quarterback. Like you look at this team, they have interceptions. They have upside. This defense has upside. They're going to sack Purdy. Hopefully they force him into a couple mistakes. I think Debo Samuel potentially missing this game is huge. Like I think it's a very underrated like miss of this team. Like they beat Green Bay last week, but they did not beat Green Bay last week. I mean, let's just call it how it was. Green Bay kind of just lost that game. Um and it had nothing to do with Jordan Love's last pass. And he, he got criticized a lot. He's very, very young quarterback. And he 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 had a good he had a really solid game. But the 49ers did not look like that powerhouse 49ers team in that game. Yeah, I think Debo is a huge part of what makes San Francisco's uh, offense so efficient because they use him in so many different ways. They use him out of the backfield. They use him on the short uh, passing game, like screen type of stuff. Like Debo is a huge part of the efficiency of this offense. So if he misses, yeah, I I definitely love Lions defense. I think I'm playing Lions defense if Debo plays or if he doesn't play. And if Debo yeah, plays, I'm going to be underweight on Debo for what it's worth because shoulder injury where he was in that much pain, yeah, I mean, it's a week, but I feel like I'm going to be very careful with my exposure to him. All right, let's play the morning grind game. A little bit more simulated here because it is such a, a small slate, but we're going to have some fun with it because that's what we do. Give me a quarterback for 300 plus passing yards here. Uh, I will go Brock Purdy. I like it. I'm going to stay in that game and go Jared Goff. Uh, low owned running back for a touchdown. Anybody besides Christian McCaffrey, um, whoever you think is going to score a touchdown here. I will take David Montgomery. I uh, just think the the red zone role, the, the inside the five role is a little bit better than Gibbs. Gibbs can certainly score one from further out, uh, but if they get down there in close, they should be handing off to Montgomery. I'm going to go Gus Edwards to score a touchdown this week. We we forget about how bad Kansas City's run defense is. Um, and honestly, like, I don't think – James Cook dropped a touchdown last week, and I was furious. Um <laughs> I needed. I had a, a eight leg. I think eight leg parlay, six or eight. That just needed James Cook touchdown, and I had his prop bet by itself. Oh, so frustrating. Quarterback, wide receiver, stack for a touchdown. I will go. Ooh. give me, give me Jared Goff to Josh Reynolds. Goff to Reynolds. I like that one. Reynolds redstone roll, man. It's it's incredible. I believe I don't want to be I don't want to misquote this. I'm pretty sure that uh, Reynolds leads the Lions in end zone targets this season, which yeah. is just that's wild. The trust is there. And, and like they've played together before. The trust is there. Give me Mahomes to Rice. Wide receiver for eight plus targets this week. Um, I mean Amonra is is kind of the cheat code there. Um, I don't love anybody else to do it. Honestly, I mean, I, I have a second favorite. I'm I'm gonna go with Monra though. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go Ayuk. Um, gosh, I, I want to say Rice. I That's think Rick, guy I, I, I think Rice yeah. is gonna have a big game. Yeah, for what it's worth. Oh, let's go tight end for a touchdown. All of them, all four of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can we just roll with that? Let Let's make that our our parlor this week. Uh, I might, I might fire that up. All four stud tight ends. Oh, what I is? Like what, hold on, we're gonna. That's gotta on. be a big number. 
Oh, I'm I'm trying to pull it up. Let's <laughs> see what it is. I'll look it up. But do you have a specific tight end you like? Um, oh, we can't do that, can we? Because it's you can't. You'd have. Oh to yeah, same game. game. Yeah, you'd have to pick one from each game. Um, in round round robin, the the two layers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Let's see here. I mean, I I think Kelsey has the best chance of any of them to score. Um. I don't. I I have a feeling Andrews is finding the end zone though too. My, Mark Andrews is plus two fifty to score an anytime touchdown this week. Laporta is plus one seventy, and Kittle is plus one twenty. So the best value you're getting on a tight end to score a touchdown is Andrews, and I think he has just as much. Uh, yeah, I don't mind Andrews. Um, I have to. I, I'm going to go Kittle with my actual answer, but I I mean I like all of them. Um, just in general here. All right, moving on. Defense for 10 plus points. I mean, the Lions, I think it's certainly going to be my highest own, but we talked about a lot of good points there. Um, they, their pass rush is incredible. Purdy is prone to making mistakes every now and again. They're going to be my highest own, so I'm, I'm sticking with them. Jerk. <laughs> <laughs> um. I think Baltimore is going to get a lot of love this week defensively. Give me, gosh, man, I don't want to give me the chiefs. I want to, I want to save as much money this week as possible at defense. And I already kind of made my point on Detroit, but like look at Detroit's defense over the last five games. They've scored at least eight fantasy points, four times the chiefs twice, the Ravens, three to four times and the 49ers defense twice. So, I mean, what's the point of spending up for defense this week? I mean, defensive touchdowns are so unpredictable. It's it just, I mean, so many freak things happen for defensive touchdowns. So I, I don't know. I, I want to spend down as much as possible. Uh, any against the, against the spread or money line bet that you like this week? No, like I, if I was picking a side, it'd probably be the two favorites. Um, let's see, I, I do kind of like Baltimore minus three and a half. Like Kansas City's looked a lot, lot better this week, uh, but Baltimore has been the better team all season long. Again, that's kind of a lean more than like super conviction on it, but yeah, Baltimore minus three would kind of be my lean. I already bet this one, Detroit plus seven. Um, I like this line. You're getting a touchdown. The Lions are aggressive. Their play calling and their coaching is aggressive. I think if Debo ends up sitting in this game, it's a very evenly matched game. And, I mean, the weather is going to be great, so it's not like Jared Goff is going into the elements of Baltimore or Buffalo to play this game. So uh, give me Detroit plus seven. Any over-unders that you like this week? No, I, I mean, nothing that's definitely conviction. Um, Do you 50... think the total in the Baltimore game is too low? Uh, like, I was looking at this, and, like, earlier today, I was debating on betting this earlier today, and I, I'm still kind of waiting to decide if I wanted to bet this or not. But, like, 44.5 seems low for this game. Like, Lamar's upside has been so incredible, and like Baltimore has scored over thirty actually like thirty points in four of their last five games alone. Like, I feel like this total's too low. Yeah, I mean, I, so my like before I started researching, my initial lean was going to be, oh, I, I'll probably like the under in Chiefs Ravens. I'll probably like the over in Lions Forty ers and then I open it up and I see forty four and a half in Chiefs Ravens and fifty and a half in Lions and Niners, and I kind of flipped them. I kind of yeah. like the over in the first game and the under in the second game, which is the opposite of, of how I thought I would feel. Yeah, just, and again, I'm still debating on if I want to bet this or not, but, I mean, I kind of like it. You know what, Keith? I'm going to fire a little little parlay. We're going to do a little on-air morning grind parlay. I'm going to take Detroit plus seven, and I'm going to take the over in the Chiefs game. So, I like it. Fire it up. All right. Um, oh, any? Let's go to the player props and pick them here. Any player props standing out to you? Uh, yeah, my favorite one is uh, Brock Purdy over twenty nine and a half passing attempts. Uh, yep. You talked about Detroit being the best run DVOA in in the league. 
Um, they have Christian McCaffrey out of the backfield. They're going to get him the ball. If he, if they have, if they struggle to run it, he's going to get a ton of, of checkdowns. Um, like I, I just, I love that, that bet. And he, he's been under it for several weeks in a row, but just the way this game sets up the way the, the lions are such a pass funnel. Um, I, I love that bet. I've already bet this. Um, I'm with you on this one. I've already bet this one. The other one that I like is Justice Hills um, under 33 and a half rushing yards. So those are the two player props that I've already bet this week. But Justice Hill, he had a really good game last week. Um, I think this is more of a Lamar Jackson kind of grinded out type of game. And I think Edwards gets a little bit more involved. It's not like Edwards is out of the mix where Justice Hill and like it just seems like this is a spot we want to take the under on Hills rushing prop. It's already, I, I saw it down to 31 and a half on a couple books already. Um, so when I bet this, it was 33 and a half. Uh, any pick em plays that you like this week? Um, Let's see. Yeah, Lamar Jackson rushing yards. Um, he had over 100 last week. The, the strength of the uh, Chiefs pass defense is their secondary. So I, I'm kind of with you. I think that Lamar has massive upside on the ground in this matchup. Uh, 64 and a half. I like more than 64 and a half rushing yards for Lamar. So you know what I did with Lamar on prize picks is I took more than 22 fantasy points. Um, I think that oh, number love, love way that too low. We talked about this yeah. last week. I'm pretty yep. sure it was you and I that were talking about this last week. So yep. um it, Lamar was 22 fantasy points last week and we took 20 the more than that he had like 29 fantasy points and like Josh Allen was at like 22 and a half and he scored like 28 so um so I I took Allen or I took Lamar's more than 22 fantasy score because I just thought that was I thought that was too low um so I totally agree with you and that feels a little bit like 64 and a half is a big big number for a quarterback um even even the best running r- rushing quarterback which Lamar is um, but you bet the fantasy score and you get the touchdown upside as well. So I, I do love that angle. Good call. For what it's worth too, if I, I know I mentioned this on the basketball podcast yesterday, but for those that may have not heard this, Christian McCaffrey has a pretty much free bonus play type of play on prize picks where more than half a rushing yard, take advantage of that and make it like a, a five pick play. Now, then you're trying to get four out of the five, um, right? Because you're going to get McCaffrey. Uh, the other one that I really like on prize picks, because we talked about Lamar, but I really like Jared Goff's fantasy score as well. It's sitting at 17. This seems low. He's going to be throwing the ball a ton in this game. They're going to be playing um, from behind is what it sounds like. So I, I like this one. I know it's a tough matchup, and the 49ers defense is solid, but they haven't been as good lately as, as they've been all year. So... I'm going to take uh, more than 17 fantasy points for Jared Goff as well. But take advantage of the fantasy projections on prize picks because some of them are kind of soft this week. I, I've already done a lot with that. And you can look at our projections and kind of compare them. So do that. Uh, Keith, any final thoughts before you get out of here? This is probably our last fo- last time we'll talk football until um, next season. So it's been, been a pleasure. Uh, tons of fun. Lots of success this year so but glad to hang around with everybody for a little football talk yeah it's been fun was it our third season doing football i know it's our at least our second right i know yep. i think it's our third season I think third. um yeah we'll probably talk about the big game at some point we'll probably throw it to the end of a basketball podcast but um i haven't made the february schedule yet <laughs> february <laughs> schedule has already given me gray hair daytona 500 and nascar coming back <laughs> um so appreciate everyone hanging out with us for football this this season it's been a ton of fun i'm hoping and and i know this is probably not going to happen but i'm hoping chiefs lions i think that would be a fantastic super bowl with a lot of scoring a lot of fireworks but wouldn't be shocked i i really want the lions i, I just i want the lions They're i don't care team. yeah the fun they, team they just have a bunch of great playmakers like st brown is awesome laporta is awesome gibbs is awesome like it's a fun team to root for and it's a young team, up and coming. Like I'm, I'm with you. I want to see the Lions in there too. And I, and I'm a Bears fan. Jared Goff is very underrated this year. Like yeah. he he got kicked to the curb, and he's he's played really good this year. So yeah. appreciate everyone hanging out with us. We're back tomorrow, Friday, talking NBA. Good luck, everyone. We'll see you then.